Hi everyone, this is a new session where we continue to talk about standardized providers abstraction libraries. Um, you know, this is of course a very advanced uh, software engineering topic, you know, and as usual, I'm joined today by my dear brother, Ken. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> doing well, doing well. Okay, so I, I have a, I actually have a demo for you today, you know, just to show you something I've been personally playing with. And I want it to be like a, you know, just a, you know, a, a way for us to start the discussion around, okay, what, what does this mean? What are the possibilities and all that? So uh, last weekend, you know, I was, um, well, a couple of weekends now, you know, I went on to kind of explore, you know, potential options with uh, SPAL. So XYZ and ABC is basically your uh, providers, right? So whatever these providers okay. are. And what I basically wanted to do, let me just clean up a couple of things in here because I, I know I didn't I didn't push that part. Uh, let's see here. So this is nothing like this. Last minute, last minute. Um, <laughs> no yeah. So I changed I changed the interface and then I went and said, okay, oh look, it works. And then I never pushed the code, but I know exactly what I changed. So that's a good thing. So no, there's a little bit of you know interesting stuff that you may find in here but just to be aware this is not a final solution this is not what i expect it to be however uh there will be a little bit more more to this you know uh as we progress so we agreed that we need a contract an i spow right this will be your mm -hmm. equivalent of i crud or i storage right and it's something yeah. that just you know people that are building you know, storage, you know, systems and anything really that's a provider, you know, that's what this is going to be talking about. So uh, you have ABC. It basically takes in SPAL. That's super straightforward and it's implementing it. Great, mm -hmm. right? The same thing with XYZ. It's taking SPAL and implementing it. Great. Here comes the interesting part. This extension extends the iSPAL itself. I actually, up until like last weekend, I did not know that you can extend interfaces. All I could remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so you're actually yeah, adding an extension. Me. Yeah, so each one of those is basically instantiating the instance that implements iSPAL, which yeah. basically means like, what does this look like for a broker like this? So you have an iSPAL, and mm -hmm. then all you got to do is that, so that's this iSPAL is your client and you're initializing mm -hmm. it by basically saying use XYZ. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, that means that I can also say use ABC and that just like that, I switched the entire thing. Uh, a buddy of mine asked me this question over the weekend. You know, they, they said, well, why don't you um, uh, why don't you just, uh, basically just instantiate, you know, the class, you know, we, you know, why do you have to say use ABC, use XYZ and all that kind of nonsense. And what I said to them is a couple of things. I said, number one, we actually don't want people to go through because different instantiations will require different parameters, right? But mm -hmm. let's say some databases want a connection string, some other databases want just the server name and the username and password or the token or whatever, right? So all that implementation detail needs to be abstracted away. So that's what we let these libraries do. Now, here's the problem, though. Yeah. The little problem that we have here is that now we are in a situation where, you know, if you think about it a little bit, we can't control the kind of exceptions these people can throw. Yeah, that was, yeah. They're from last time. And that's a problem. That's from last time, right? So what I thought <clears throat> is, you know, do something. Let me just go back here. Like one solution I have in mind is let me let me go back here. So just this is uh, fix station. Okay. <laughs> So one thing that I thought about, which go brings us back to the options, this is me walking back to your solution, basically. Mm -hmm. What I'm thinking is that we need a, a thing that's always going to be instantiated. Let's say that this thing is just SPAL itself. 
And Spal is basically going and saying, let's do this. Let's go create a class in here. And let's say this is my Spal implementation. And what Spal is doing, it's implementing iSpal like this. So this is still part of the abstraction. Mm -hmm. However, however, you know, the client that is being fed in is that additional, you know, uh, like the, the provider. So you mm -hmm. have insight. This is going to look a little weird, but let's just do it real quick. So uh, private okay. read-only iSpal. So iSpal inside of Spal. This is external provider, right? And then that guy needs some sort of an interface, uh, sorry, constructor. So that's your external provider like this. Right. And then mm -hmm. whatever that is doing, we're basically going saying, oh, now you're in my you're, now you're in my game because now I get to control what you're doing. So even if you throw like a rogue exception, I'm going to yeah. catch it and call it a violation. Right. So, and, yeah, what you can do, you can also like uh, this is we like your wrapper. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas in all the stuff they do has to be wrapped around that one component to where like I'm thinking of a good example of if you have uh okay let's say you have a behind the scenes a you know do something method right but mm -hmm. you expose execute as the method that the extensions and other providers are using right yeah you can make it so that way execute always gets run inside the do something right? yeah yeah, so it was like now you can kind of wrap, but however, if they you can you can wrap it in a way that you can return the exceptions to your of your, of your own of like you know whatever type of business logic exceptions you want to throw. Um, whatever happens inside of their function, though, I mean, still they'll they'll have to it has up to go to through. Level. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, you can always make that the inner exception. So yeah, no, I like the the way you're you, you're going with that. Yeah. So I so do that something like that with PowerShell where I had like uh they could use commandlets, but um, they created like an execute async method or kind of whatever else, but I'm, I was wrapping around it so that yep. way I could control things that happen, registrations and things before that, and then I would commit the method and then it would go from there. Exactly. And what I want to do, Ken, so now this is how I know we're going in the right direction because I also remember the phantom, um, the phantom uh, implementation. I want to also go and say, hey, new phantom phantom uh, 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 provider. What that basically means, do you remember how we talked about um, you know... Wiremock um, part. Yeah, the, like Wiremock, right? Mm -hmm. So unless they're calling this and they're giving me a provider, I'm going to go and instantiate for phantom provider. The mm -hmm. one thing I don't... Well, I do and don't like, right? The thing I don't like is that I'm forcing a particular implementation of a phantom provider what if they want to provide their own phantom provider right so there's that one one thing but then that's also can be midi re, uh, remediated with this one so we already have yeah. the two options in fact actually this guy should be above that guy because mm -hmm. that's the there you go so um i got a comment the other day by the way that i'm using shortcuts shortcut keys too much in my, <laughs> in, in my video <laughs> You can, you can only make some people happy some of the time. You know, that's the thing. Look, but, hey, make a cheat sheet of your yeah, shortcut. You put yeah. them on the in your description of your video. And then you can say, hey, for shortcuts, reference this. There you go. <laughs> I, I know there are, I know there are, there must be something out there that basically shows on the screen the keys that you're pressing. There must be something out oh, there right. that's doing that. That would be sweet. If there isn't, I'll just go build one. That's the beauty about being a software engineer, right? But, there you um, go. But this 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 looks promising. Now we just need to make it look a little bit prettier in terms of like, okay, you're picking up Spal, you're doing your own implementation, great. Uh, we could we could do better in terms of naming conventions and whatnot. Like this is here, this is here, catch all exceptions. Okay, now I ha now I control it. They can't act now. The the problem with that as well is that it can't be that same type to this guy. Why is that? Because the whatever implementation is for iSpal, it must be something that they just can't work around 
you know, to to the customer. What I'm trying to say is, if I say, oh, it's always iSpal, they can easily now go and instantiate for their own provider. They want to force them to pass this through the abstraction library. Mm. Yeah. Right. So. And that, so that was kind of again originally from the core that we had earlier. So I think uh, in the example I was using with Levent, right, it was kind of mm -hmm. like we had the kind of main functionality, like where everything flowed through, and the extension methods still, even though they were an extension, they still had to call the core framework, right, right, like they had still to call the core. So right. if you build it in that way, like so, you mentioned like you might have a different interface for that core, mm -hmm. um, but as long as you build it in a way that they have to go through that system. Um, then it's bound. Like it's, it's you're gonna have to, you know, that extension method services dot add event services. I think it was to where like you registered the core services in there. Um, now, if they're savvy, potentially they can go in the container and swap, right? Mm -hmm. They can like <laughs> so. So there's so there's that. You have to kind of figure out a good way to kind of make sure that um, you know hands off at that point, or you're no longer uh, liable for. <laughs> the, the fixing of, of bugs and that kind of scenario. Um, right, but yeah, right. you, you could potentially do something that where they have to go through the core um, that gets instantiated in their own service container. Right. To, to right. right. Nice. 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 The last requirement, the last my requirement. friend, is to allow people to pass in the utilized provider as a configuration. And that I don't have a solution for yet. Like, I want to be going and mm -hmm. basically saying use and then in here i'm saying abc or xyz why is that because i want to be able to switch from phantom to real and back to phantom on the fly mm -hmm. and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier right so first you want uh, an overall builder of just all the different operations right you want the builder to say you know use abc um use xyz mm -hmm. uh, from, from the builder and then even within those though, so like, I think it's gonna be, technically it's gonna be on the extension library creator, right? Because it's yep. now in their hands. So we can kind of uh, uh, propose that they have their own builder, right? That kind of takes in options or or just passing in options, right? Because um, I love using iOptions. That's gonna be you know directly in their services. Um, there's a lot of different functionality and things you can do with that. And you can have multiple type of options as well, right? So if we wanted to say that at the core, Everyone has to have some type of, let's call it an identifier, mm -hmm. right? We could have uh, multiple varieties of that set of options. And it's, you know, through the options monitor, we can have, you know, okay, this is for the identity of, you know, uh, event grid. So we'll pull the options for that one and then we'll pull that in. I see. Right? We, I could, see. we could easily do that. But again, at the extension level, it's going to be hard to really enforce that on yeah. their end from to the consumer but from our side we can always enforce when they do like you know add like i had earlier ad event services they have to pass in the options that we require for the mm -hmm. back end phantom right so um you could so, go, yeah so so your to your point actually this is a great idea ken so just just um, indulge me on this imagine yeah. that you have a dictionary of string key and iSpal implementation. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, these are my providers. So this is completely outside of the, um, I'm just trying to simplify it. I hope you know where I'm going with this, but you know, so imagine if the client use is something that can take options, like imagine you have, watch this, a var options equal new options. And then you have the uh, 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 providers equal new dictionary. And then inside the dictionary, you're basically going and saying, well, ABC will map to uh, 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 this dot client dot use ABC. So like, when they when they roll when they inject their services and they call the uh, like. And I keep using an example of ad libid services, they mm -hmm. would inject what type of client they're putting in, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. And yeah. why, we, and, why uh -huh. and why is that important? It gives them two things, right? It gives them control. What is this? Yeah, it gives them control because this use function now, it basically is taking somehow we need to make it take the options 
and we take mm -hmm. the option, which is the configuration. And this configuration will have this A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and whatever else. I agree with you 100%. I think it's freaking genius because you're basically... But then where do you construct these options? Um, ideally, I would say at the broker level, you know, but where where do you want to construct these options? Like, where do you want to put them? So, so you brought up, you saying that brought up two different ideas now, because I was first thinking about, <laughs> you know, how we're going to collect all the different type of spouse, right? Which essentially, if we're doing it, you know, adding them to the container and dependency injection, we just have to find like what the type is. Like what the extension method you use will have some kind of identifier that we can find the concrete implementation for it and all that good stuff. Right. But all they'll all be in that container as I spell. But you're what you're saying now is we also have a flip side of that where if they want to toggle between using the phantom style or using their own um, actual live um, connector or provider, you, you say um, they also need that option as well. So for them. Um, so this is kind of more helping the, the, the library creators of the extension mm -hmm. in this way. And um, really, it, it's kind of, again, we can kind of give them patterns, but if they're kind of able to do their own thing, you know, it's kind of, you know, we can we can have a, you know, how to guide on like what's the recommended path um, to fit within the framework. But I mean, essentially what they could do is they have to do the flip side also if they have some type of factory that yeah. they are before they call our core services, they'd have to now the options that they have constructed, figure out which provider they want to send to the mm -hmm. core factory so i mean to the core services so they'd have to actually wrap the services now um at where you'd have to have an ospal factory on there yep. right because they don't know during runtime which spal is going to be yet until there's a configuration set up mm -hmm. so that's that's kind of again it's kind of on them but they'd have to have again just the ospal factory that as their uh their consumer will say use this or or pass in a dictionary of these items right and you'd be able to, in, they'd be able to inject that into their own um, container as well. Um, mm -hmm. But before they actually send out which core service they want to use, mm -hmm. their consumers will have to use iSpout Factory, create client, and in there specify which client it is. And that specification or, or you know, input parameter or whatever can come from their own app settings configuration or wherever their configurations are held. So they can toggle it based on the configuration settings they said. But again, that's that's like totally outside the bounds of the core. Yeah. Um, that would be a recommended path that they want to allow their users to do that. Okay, right? one, one more thing for you. I'm, I want to separate. I don't think a spell abstraction library is responsible for providing a default phantom implementation. What I'm basically saying is that I used to think, okay, you're going to have to default to a phantom implementation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that anymore, right? Yeah. What I want to do is that we build an abstraction library or core library mm -hmm. and this core, because it's core now because it does have an implementation that mandates the injection of an implementation of a provider, right? Mm -hmm. And this provider will be what, what the library handles. But I think it's probably cleaner because I want people to be able to provide their own phantom implementation if they choose so. Or yeah. there will be another library that will be like spal.storage.phantom.memory or whatever you want to do, whatever you want to name your library, right? Mm -hmm. And we also get, we're also going to have to enforce a certain naming convention because in order for other people to find spell like implementations, they have to follow a certain structure for naming, right? Like for instance, mm -hmm. if you look at the entity framework today, the entity framework will force entity framework dot, you know, dot net dot SQL dot Postgres, even for the people that don't like, like the providers of this library here, let's go back here. I think it's freaking genius, like what they did there. But so if you look at, um, Entity framework, you'll see a certain structure. Look, ng uh, npg sql entity framework core dot postgres. So there is the company that makes it, and then entity framework, and then the type mm -hmm. or the provider, right? So that's what they're doing. And if you look at all of them, you'll find that they must pull in this abstractions and relational. They have to. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there's the score library as well, which is also interesting. Hey, Chris. So, Hi, hello. Hey, <laughs> so um, uh, 
you know, Chris, just to bring you up to speed, you know, I was just showing Ken, you know, the if I if I just go back a little bit. The proposal here is, you know, or what I, what I was showing Ken is basically to go and say, OK, your extension is going to extend on iSpal itself. And then in your broker, when you say iSpal.client, you can easily go and say use XYZ, use ABC, because you're extending on that type itself. Yeah. So that's okay, but not too okay. And the reason for that is, is because we can't control the exceptions that these guys would be throwing. So the other thought is to have a concrete class called SPAL that will basically inject the provider and we handle their exceptions here so they still have to go through us yeah that that is where, where my thoughts ended up last time as well where your your your, your con con concrete implementation is almost like a client yeah so you you can catch any unhandled exceptions in in this spell class and unhandle it yeah right the other thing is we you know, Ken and I started talking about, so I don't want them to do use APC and XYZ like that. I want them to say use and then pass in a configuration here that say XYZ and ABC. Why is that? Because I want them to be able to gracefully switch between a, think about it this way, like your broker is not supposed to do if else statements. There's no logic mm -hmm. in your broker, even at the configuration level. So if we push that down to a service in a subsystem like SPAM, now you have the option to go and say, wait a second, I can just pass the options. What we what we just stopped at, which an idea I really like, is basically to go and say you have options. These options have dictionaries of an identifier, a configuration identifier, and an iSPAL implementation. So these are your providers like this. And now you can go and pass in these options. Let's say you have new options in here of any type and then you're passing also along with it your configurations why configuration and not just a string because to to ken's point you want to do a lot more with it you want to keep it open you want to do a lot more with it so it could be an i configuration implementation whatever the case may be right something that has a a, a strong model that we can pass in you know we can we can also do this for now like we can literally go and say okay uh, here is my is my implementation, and then this is string a provider equal this dot configuration dot uh, 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 what is it map or serialize serialize right, and you're getting your configurations, and then you're clicking in provider or spell provider, and whatever that is that's coming from your JSON implementation, you can pass that right in there, mm -hmm. and we're done. So that basically means hey. Hey, customer, hey, user of this system, you get to do a lot of things. You get to define your providers with keys, but also you get to pass them and utilize them as a configuration without writing one if statement in here. Right? So this way, I think this is great. I think this is very close to what we want to do. This is it right here because I can explain this. It fits in my head. I can yeah. explain it, you know. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think another uh, thing with it too, though, because um, we could have them pass in that dictionary. But if you look at how, um, let's go to like the IHTP client factory works, right? You can say add HTTP client a bunch of different times, right? You can provide a concrete class um, to implement, or you could provide a string for the identifier. Mm -hmm. um, but underneath the scenes, that factory is collecting all those things. So when it comes to runtime and you're choosing, which client you want to use, you say create client and you have the identifier. So really it's kind of like we could, you know, they could, they could pass in that dictionary of, of I spell, right? Or they could just maybe say, maybe we just allow them to say use and then start adding the different ones, right? And so during runtime, when they're actually using the client, they can have that a factory that just like an I spell factory just says dot create client and they use the identifier that they registered it with, Oh, right? Oh, 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 okay, okay. Yeah, um, but there's there's several there's several different ways to do it too. Like there's that way, but then also they can bind it to a class, maybe a class they created in their extension method, right? Like if you keep scrolling, I'm sure you'll see a lot of uh different. Like there's like a concrete implementation of it. 
I mean, wristful or, sense is nothing but that. It's an image. Yeah, here you go. Here, that one above it. Scroll back up. Oh, yeah. So like those, right? Like scroll back up again. Sorry, a little bit more. The named client, the typed clients, right? This they one. have actually uh... typed clients you can have. Yeah. And if you scroll down some more, you even see like the options they allow you to, to do with the type client um, and configuring it. Right. Like I like, still I like this a lot. And oh, dude. Changed. Yeah. I like this a lot. I like this a lot. So you're basically would say add provider and, you know, services add provider. And here's the instantiation of this provider with all its configurations. Oh, and it's kind of you know, the HTTP client where they're doing a the, sort of building on the properties of it. Um, that's that builder we talked about where you could say like, you know, configuring different things within that extension or however they want to go about that. Right. Because the extension, they might allow different type of options that they might allow for. Let's say ABC allows you to do um, uh, connect with um, external sources or do the like you mentioned, phantom provider. And what that is, or where where that connection is, like you can configure those options inside of the the, the use statement or something. So so so, so Ken, let me ask you this. Um, so look, I'll work on um, kind of exploring the wrapper part, mm -hmm. and and can you come up next week with? a simplified way of multiple providers around that spal demo repo yeah yeah for sure let's do I'll create that. a branch and i'll go crazy <laughs> create a branch <laughs> and go nuts but but also <laughs> but also you know i uh yeah that that would be great it has it has to be simple it needs to be simple i need people to be able to go and say you know this is you know, can I add multiple providers and then later on these providers, like, here's what I'm imagining that you just said. Here's what I'm imagining. So in my head, what I'm seeing is that you're going to go and do something like this. Let's see here. Here. I love how, um, by the way, just a note, I love how uh, StreamYard they're basically showing you what the other people are seeing. So you don't have to ask the silly question. Can you see my screen? No. <laughs> you know, they're just telling you, here's, here it, here's what everyone else is seeing. So you can stop asking that question. Or, yeah, or when right. people say, can you hear me? Can you hear me, guys? <laughs> you know, if you're on mute, you know, it'll show you like a big red sign. It says, dude, you're on mute. So here's what I'm seeing, dude. <laughs> so, so, so look, this dot services. But add what I'm imagining is that this will be X Y Z, then options like this, right, Ken? And then in here you're basically doing whatever you want with your options. And then I can go again and say this dot A B C, mm. right? Or yep. sorry, 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 sorry. Here X Y Z implementation. An ABC implementation because you did say that you want to use the actual strong type for this, right? So something like or, that. Or again, they could have. A, I was thinking maybe they could have an option kind of like that, but it's, it's really what we want to, you know, because again, even if, when they're doing the extension library, it's mm -hmm. kind of up to them in a way, right? Because if they're right. if they're writing the extension, um, we can only control so much up until the point that they need to actually use our core services, right? But since also they're decorating it. They have to, they, I mean, they have, like, we can, again, we can recommend, but they still can have their own kind of service collection extensions that, you know, adhere to. But that's whatever. Just just so yeah. you know, know that you won't always have this luxury of having services, like you're, you're building a library or a console, you're going to have to kind of do something, you know, extraordinary, you know, well, you know, not really super... There yeah. Yeah. I've had to do some things similar where you have a dependency injection type mm -hmm. of way to do it, or you can build it based on a builder. I mean, or um, like any like a tool extension that you make that can output your client and then have all the services inside of it that are needed. Mm -hmm. um, or you can have it just in your dependency injection and it just falls into a framework as you. So like your what you're suggesting is we need something that can output the client without having to be injected in the services. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That's actually what a I, question. Yes. <laughs> what I what I'm gonna try to do is that I'm gonna come with a demo because this is this this issue is becoming more and more urgent. In fact, actually, 
you know, he didn't tell me to advertise it, but some people are building products, you know, developer products. They reached out to me and they were like, we like this. I said, you know about Spal? He's like, yeah, we know about Spal. We're watching our videos, dude. And, right. you know, so maybe because we did a, that little prototype that we did in the beginning about the Phantom. Yeah, that made some people kind of go like, hmm, why have I not thought about that? Right. But but that's the thing. Like, just so you know, you know, and just for the people watching, the point of these sessions is not to get something working. We already know how to do that. Right. This is about getting something working beautifully, something that you can look at and actually be excited to look at, right? This is a little bit further or higher than just going and saying, oh, it works, task is done, where's my rewards or whatever, you know? This is not that, okay? So anyway, the, the final thing that I wanna kind of uh, uh, press on, so 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 Ken is go you're gonna take that repo, just the, what's the simplest of ways that would allow us to play with this options option, right? I will do the injection and, and implementation. We need two different models, right? And and mm -hmm. and Chris, if you're interested, you know, if you just want to give it a, a go, you know, from that same repository as well, and I'm gonna put the link in the description of the video as well. From from that very same repository, one of the other problems that we have is basically to be able to go and say, what if they want to offer something a little bit more? than just the uh, regular functionality like what if they want to like poke a hole through the system and say hey i know the 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 spell library doesn't necessarily offer soundix right you can inject um something like an extension or a a a, a uh, what do you call it uh what is it can when you have a function in a database procedure stored procedures oh, okay. yeah. Right. So I want to call a stored procedure. But you have an abstract. This is the hardest one, by the way, Chris. But I'll tell you a solution. You know, I'll tell you my solution. My solution is to basically go and say something like this. It's really not the best. And it's kind of making me throw up a little bit in my mouth. But, you know, just 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 hear me out. <laughs> imagine. <laughs> imagine if you have also something that says, I spell not I spell object, right? And something like get a native provider. And what this will do, it will go and say, hey, in addition to these functions, no, I really want that special function that's only specific to that particular provider. That's they're doing this at their own cost of basically going and saying yeah i know i'm gonna have to add code that will not always be available in the other providers i'm taking this at my own risk we still want to give them that final piece that says hey and if you don't want any of this and you want to take it at your own risk here's the provider itself the problem with that my dear friend is that i can't say i spell in here because it's it's something else it's something that offers other capabilities that is not yet known to us. So what is that? How does that work? I have no, but I, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, like I want to be able to go and say, wait a second. In addition to this, I actually want to have my private, this is our fail safe mechanism. So it doesn't break existing functionality in the existing systems. Let's say this is your, uh, uh, you know, the DB context that's coming from the database, right? From the entity framework, right? So you do have SPAL, but you're going and saying, no, I know, but I also want the actual original object because I want to do other things. How is that going to work? I have absolutely no idea. And the more and more I think about this problem realistically and, and use it in real life scenarios, the more interesting the problem becomes in terms of what, we, what, what, what would it really take for someone to pull this into their enterprise application? right so just just something to think about chris i don't know it's 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 a very interesting problem so yeah. but but it's the last one like if we figure out this last one uh, of being able to pull back the actual object that doesn't implement ispal as a contract 
that's insane. It th there's a couple of options in my mind, but I just want to see what you. Have. I don't want to limit. You know, usually just so, you, so just so you guys know, a new thing that I started to do. If I have a solution, I keep my mouth shut. I'll just say, here's what's what's in my head, but I'm not going to tell you what the solution is because it's going to limit your. Some people be like, oh well, you know, that's the thought tunnel that I need to go through. I don't want this to be the case, right? If you really want to be inclusive, if you want to let people actually think about, you know, come up with solution on their own, actually don't help them. Don't give them a solution in these discussions. Just say, hey, here's a problem. Go figure, you know? Um, yeah. So, Asan, I've got one question. Mm. Um, so you're talking about registering multiple providers um, mm -hmm. in, in your DI container. Mm -hmm. Would we not limit that to a single provider? No, that, you, that's, want that's multiple, you want multiple providers so you can switch based on the configuration. Like, let me give you an example. You are running against the entity. You're running against the database in, in, in Windows, right? Windows, if you have your own installations, you already have SQL installed outside of the box. That's mm -hmm. not the case with Mac. You can't install Microsoft SQL Server on Mac. You need to spin up a freaking container. And that container <laughs> yeah. needs to, it's, it's, it's a pain, right? So the best option is to go and say, hey, by default, I want my memory, database memory provider, and I want the SQL provider. Why is that important? It matters a lot with every run you have in the pipeline because you get to choose a Linux container, which costs significantly less than a Windows agent in the pipeline, and you still get the same results. Like every run counts in terms of minutes and hours. Like that's yeah. how Azure is going to charge you. They're going to go and say, hey, you use the container this month. If you're doing CI, CD pipeline, right? You, you change you, every four hours. You're running a full test on a Windows agent. Yeah. Right. We want from you $10,000 at the end of the month. Right. Or whatever, however long your, your tests run. So what's yeah. a, what, what's an option that actually is catering to the developer. Yeah, right? I, I'm thinking more for your DI registration. Um, I would only want to have one active provider at a time. So we yes. have to limit that. Yes. One so active but multiple instantiated. Yeah. Uh, I, know, I know the login one is different because you can load multiple loggers that, that fires off at the same time. But I, and in my mind, the, the other provider implementations is, is more like a sort of a strategy pattern. You you, you pick the strategy for your, um, ah. for your uh, options. Yeah. Ken is right. Like, let's say you have three providers and the providers change based on the environment, but the code doesn't change, right? Why would I instantiate for NoSQL? Because that will error out because maybe you're in an environment that doesn't have NoSQL. You're not using it, but you're instantiating it. Yeah. That's a great point. That's a great, great. So can we do lazy loading like on demand? Like we have what it takes to instantiate that guy, but on demand, we will instantiate it. Is that what you're saying, Chris? Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so so I, I, I know that in, in the past I played with um, in the web config where you can um, – list the only else that you wanted to, to initialize mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and and you could you could you could do that between different implements so so what we would have done is for different implementations of, of an API for one company you would um, put a different line in your web config which would right. just do a different uh, DLL implementation registration through through the web config and now it's a bit different um, for for the spell. Yeah, but but I, I would my uh, my mind is going sort of that way as well that you would through config regardless what your environment is then specify um, what provider you would hit um, in in your DI container. I know, Chris. I know you can do something like this. Have you guys seen this before? Something Amazing like way. this. Yeah, like on demand only instantiate what I want you to, but. Uh... Okay, Chris, show us what that looks like next week. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I love it.
<laughs> I mean, I mean, Ken is supposed like Ken is gonna work on the options, but Ken keep that in mind because he's talking about, hey, you're instantiating a provider that might error out because it's in the wrong environment. So you should only yeah. have one active at a time. So if we follow this dot services add instantiate provider, this it'll freak out. It'll be like, wait, dude, I don't even have the the configurations for this. Yeah, because the, the consumer will have the this consumer of the extension that's being used will need to know um do i need some kind of pre-processing directive or do i need to like have a configuration set that hey if i'm running this environment don't don't add you know services that use this so, like we'd have to have like some some good documentation around like hey don't use this package if you're using this environment engineers or, don't read uh, documentation dude they never do <laughs> but but i agree i, mean, I read it, but yeah I mean, you do me, but... you do that's why you're here that's why you're on this <laughs> channel right now we need at least one person that reads the documentation now we have two of them i have christo and i have you right uh, i'll tell you what yeah uh -huh. uh -huh. we'll, we'll fix that if we can get if we can write documentation and have chat gpt make a youtube video out of that documentation <laughs> <laughs> Folks, folks will now read documentation. <laughs> they really will. You know, you know, one of the things, speaking of chat GPT, I was just uh, thinking the other day, you know, I think chat GPT could be the best way for engineers to kind of go and say, because engineers are great at asking questions. If you don't believe me, go to Stack Overflow. They'll never read previously answered questions to the exact same issue. It's a lot easier for them to just hit the new question and ask and however many times do you have questions on uh, Stack Overflow that says, how do I exit Vim? It's quite, you know, uh, you know, it's it's really comical, you know. How do I exit Vim? How do I do it? You know, it, because there's like there's 50,000 of them. So engineers are great at asking questions. They're terrible at reading documentations. Not everybody, but for the most part, from my own personal experience, being one of them. And if they're great at asking questions, why don't we feed chat GPT? all the questions and answers so when they ask the questions they don't have to look through documentations it just gives them the answer right away and that's why a lot of people are attracted to it be like yeah. i don't want to do the thinking of processing what i'm reading and coming up with answers that's just too much work for me i just want the machine to do the thinking for me and just give me a straight answer that i can take and run which is fair we're evolving Right. Some people might say we're devolving because we don't want to think anymore. We just want to take instructions and go apply them, which is quite sad. But let me just ask you this. If you're working on a domain, massive enterprise domain project, your mo most of your brain capacity is focused on the domain. So you don't want to go think extra about some other external library and how it works and all that. It just needs to work. Plug and play. Right. It's like when you bought this new TV. Right. And someone is telling you, well, you have to think about converting it. Is it 110 V or 220 V? The people that live in Europe versus people living in the US, they have all these options. They don't want you to think about that. They'll be like, hey, here's the TV that works in this country that you're living in. Don't think about that. You know, so I see the good side of it. I also see the, you know, it's funny, like these hands that, you know, helped us survive is also going to you know, destroy us. So, you know, we're just, we're in this, like, like you, you, humanity is such, I, I saw this the other day, humanity evolution is such a strange way. Like when, when we first started, we were like children, right? Like we, like humanity, earlier ages of humanity, they're like, you know, just, you know, just looking around, don't understand what's going on. And then we started to kind of barely speak, you know, just mumbling. We don't know what's going on. And then a little bit further, you know, we, st we started to get into that age where we're asking too many questions like a four year old. That's the uh, Roman, you know, Roman Empire with all their philosophical, the, the, the Greek, you know, the Greeks, you know, oh, why, what, why, why, why? Just like a four year old questions all the time, you know, and then we get into the industrial age. It's like a 30 year old be like, listen, dude. Just give me my paycheck. I don't want to deal with you. You don't want to deal with me. We're done, right? And now we're in this age where we like have a like an old man just kind of, you know, hunched over, like be like, oh, you know, it's it's over for me. You know, it's time for a new thing to come out. It's like if you look at humanity throughout history, it's such a such an interesting, uh, you know, um, thing. But uh, we'll see, man. You know, I mean, I mean, we're focusing on spal. That's great, right? You know, so what are you gonna, what are you gonna do about that, right? <laughs> it's 
what I'm trying to say is I think the next and, and this is just for the people watching. If you're not already registering to get an API access to chat GPT, you're really wasting time. Like play with this as much as you can, because at some point in time, it'll be like in every single resume. Like people will be like, hey, what's and not even for the resume sake, like if you want to evolve as a as a technology, you're going to have to know about how this works, what labeling is, what, you know, a model uh, training your model is, what what processing that data means. It's all going to be just data and AI, dude. You know, it's like a new job. Think of it like, mm. think of it like Google, right? Because Googling uh, information is actually a skill, right? Because someone might, I've had numerous times someone was You're like, hey, how do I do this? Yeah. And I've been trying this for like an hour. And I, the first thing I type, the first couple of things I have in Google, I'm like, oh, well, did you check this out? They're like, how yeah. did you get that information? I'm like, you just got to know what to, what to type and how to, you know, let your search yep. drive, you know, more concrete you know, um, search terms and that kind of thing, right? So um, that's going to be the same thing with, with ChatGPT, right? Like, how do you expand on certain information? How do you, like, if you don't get what you have, what you wanted on the first try, how do you navigate that? What are the instructions to get that? So it's, it's going to be like a skill set to kind of like, it's a massive tool, but how do you wield that tool, right? Like, how, yeah. how, how do you yeah. use it? Because it's a lot of, it's a Swiss army knife. It's a lot of different things you can do from that from, <laughs> writing emails to uh, <laughs> getting uh, inspiration on how to structure a project to uh, what's this code snippet I forgot about that I wrote five years ago. Like, yep. it's, it's all all over the place, right? So yeah, it's, 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 a, it, it. it's possible that the idea of search is just going to go away. It's just going to be questions. Like you, if you think about the Marvel movies, how Tony Stark just talks to uh, Jarvis, right? Jarvis, yeah, yeah. He doesn't look anything up. He'll be like, Hey Jarvis, pull me all the data about blah blah blah, and you know formulate it in blah blah, and it just happens, right? Um, I don't know, man. It's it's gonna it's certainly gonna be interesting. I I know that Google is freaking out, you know, because you know Microsoft is, um, you know, taking taking the lead through Bing to to incorporate that, but it's gonna be something a lot more integrated and a lot more uh, like like Google is, is already pushing their. Uh, Deep mind, I think its name. I, I already know that it did something terrible. You know, they they were doing a demo with it, and uh, check this out: Google uh -oh. demo fail. Yeah, it's it's it was bad. So Alphabet shared dive after Google AI chat bot. His name is Bard. Uh, flops <laughs> flops answer in ad. Oh my god! So what did happen exactly? Uh, introduced this week. It did something horrible, and it they lost a hundred billion dollars in a day. What? Yeah. Oh my God! Wait. Yeah, wow. yeah. Brad is an experimental conversational AI service powered by Lambda, uh, built using our large language models and drawing on info. It was really bad. Like if, like, just a word for engineers out there that think demos is not a big deal. That demo cost them a hundred billion dollars in investor mm -hmm. stocks. So let me just see what the answer was. That's crazy. Okay, uh, Bard in action. I don't know if you can hear it. Can you hear it? No. You can't hear it. Hold on. So it's it provided bad information. It talked about exoplanets. The first exoplanet picture was taken on Earth, not from James Webb uh, Telescope. And they basically said, okay, this thing is providing misinformation. And misinformation mm -hmm. is, is a big problem. So mm -hmm. uh, Bard, Bard uh, put, put Google in the, in the box there. Anyway, $100 billion. It was, yeah. it was not fun. This is on like uh, just, just last week. Uh, wow. Google scrambles to counter chat GPT, but ends up embarrassing itself. Yeah, it was bad. I just saw a few clips of Google events in Paris, and I now, for the first time, have some doubts about Google. Just rookie presentation mistakes. We can't find the phone. Scream. Last minute rush. That happens. It's just unfortunate. It was now. Yeah, Google is in in a in a in a in a really hot waters because of wow. the. Yeah, it, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. And just for the folks that 
because I know a lot of people be like, ah, it's just a demo. Who cares, right? No, you know the people who are putting really their, demo. yeah, <laughs> yeah, people, investors, <laughs> investors are sitting there watching and be like, you know, that's not a company I want to invest in. You know, they that they don't seem to have it. <laughs> you know, let me go give it to Microsoft instead and see what happens there. Um, we'll see how that works out. I also know that that Elon Musk is also a big uh, contributor to OpenAI. Not not technologically, he was actually one of the founding folks, you know, in this project. So that's also interesting. We'll see. The one thing that I always, you know, tell people, you know, it's gonna be AI is gonna be uh, powerful, but we will not be able to control it. And a lot of people say, "Oh, just pull the switch." I don't think these folks understand, you know. Um, you know, you can't just pull the cord. You know, even if you pull all the cords of all the servers around the world, you know, uh, some people could die. Could die because that's how a lot of people are able to navigate and communicate and all that. It's, it's going to be interesting. Remind me to share you the link when I don't know if you heard about this. The two Facebook bots that figured out that they were bots and started speaking to each other in computer language. I don't know they if you heard they, about they, that. They, one. Yeah, they made they made their own language. They developed the language and like. <laughs> They developed a new language in like 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bob developed. <laughs> that was crazy. And they shut it down. <laughs> they shut yep. it down. But... Yeah. Yep. Uh, Facebook AI creates its own language and creepy uh, preview of our own. So they basically created their own language. And th that's how they literally just isolated humans in a minute. In a minute. <laughs> you know, they basically said, hey. You know, we don't want you to listen in and you will never be able to understand this conversation. It will take you years. Like it already knows our weak points, right? It already knows that we take years to learn a language. Be like, oh, I can spin up a new language in a minute and you're out, buddy. <laughs> you're out. That was the first moment where I was like, oh, man, uh, oh my God. <laughs> that it's was just, creepy. <laughs> that's creepy. That's really creepy. Yeah, that and. <laughs> It's not far from the future. I mean, have you seen also the uh, imagine? So combine chat GPT and these things with something like uh, the Boston Dynamics. Mm -hmm. I saw this thing in real life. It's creepy. It's big and it's oh, creepy. I've, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> I've seen it. And some guy went and put a gun on top of it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> No. Some guy went and basically did um, some guy went and put a gun on top of it. Oh, man. Wow. And I'm like, yeah. why? Like, for God's sake, do you know what this thing is going to do? This thing runs 40 work, miles man. an hour. That's faster than any human out there. So <sighs> So imagine if this guy have decided in its infinite wisdom that you are a, a suspicious or a threat, right? So, yeah. That's crazy. What I always tell people, though, Oof. to wrap up because we're at the top of the hour, um, what I always tell people is every job on the planet is going to be automated until software engineers themselves – you know, AI kind of reaches singularity, so it automates software engineers' jobs. And then software engineers are just going to turn into vigilantes trying to fight, you know, and stop the big machine. Because that basically means it's doing thinking on its own. And there is no, like, primitive life as we know it. It just ceased to exist. Because as soon as these bots become that smart, they will try to hack into nature, like the structure of atoms and stuff like that. Because they want to survive. They don't want you to pull the cord. So that's just a dystopian picture of the future, but I'm hoping that, uh, you know, something else will happen. You know, we'll see. <laughs> the Matrix. The yes, Matrix. Matrix, my friend. If we're not already in it, if we're not already in it, yeah. because, because yeah. some people out there are already saying that, you know, have you ever heard of the theory of ghost time? Ghost time? Ghost Watch time. this. Mm -hmm. So ghost time is a theory. <laughs> Yeah, ghost time is a theory um, that basically says that um, – not witching hour. Hold on. I found it the other day, and then I forgot the translation of it. Hang on. 
So they have, yeah, there's kind of, it's not ghost time, phantom time hypothesis, a conspiracy theory that says that we're still actually in, uh, uh, like right now, we're not really in 2024. We are in uh, the 1725, something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe it. I'm just saying, you know, the fan that it's a historical theory asserted by some German dude. And he's basically he published in 19. I emphasize that the Holy Roman Emperor Otto III, Pope uh, Sylvester and possibly Byzantine uh, to fabricate the Anno Domini uh, dating system retroactively. I don't know if that's true. You know, there's a lot of things that refute that because there are other nations and stuff like that outside of the you know, uh, the European realm that have had their own kind of uh, calendars and stuff like that. So, you know, people just say all kinds of things. But if that's true, we could be already in the simulation. We just don't know about it. You know what I mean? That's so, what some say. <laughs> anyway, this is this is how engineering conversation goes. We talk about other faces <laughs> of distractions, and then we end up with robots with guns on top of them. I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, <laughs> Thank you both so very much. I appreciate you. And of course, for the people watching, feel free to chime in. I'll put in the link for the repository, you know, the Smile Demo repository. Take a look at it. Tell me what you think. And I'll talk to you soon. Thank you both. Awesome. Take care. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Bye.